everybody. Um, this is going to last about an hour, and first I want to say thanks for coming. It means a lot to me that um, you all thought that whatever I would have to say on this subject would be worth coming to and listening to for about an hour. Um, at some point, I'm going to ask for questions, suggestions, even debates, because in reality, this is a discussion. The, the Constitution is a discussion in itself. It's an ongoing discussion. I have pieces of paper here, if you want to take them. You know, write on them, all that jazz. I don't have utensils, but... Anyway, as I was saying, this is a discussion. The Constitution has always been a discussion. I remember at the beginning of the year, um, not at the beginning of the year exactly, it was a class meeting, I think Mr. Pace said this, um, that this was my chance to be an expert, I should do it right. He said this to the whole, um, to the whole class, and um, in a bit of fraud, I have to confess that I'm not actually an expert, because no one's an expert. No one's an expert except the people who actually wrote this thing. Um, this beautiful document that I don't think anyone else could have pulled out, off at the time. Um, and it's a discussion all of America should have because it affects everyone within America. Um, so I'm not an expert, but this is my chance. I do agree on that. Um, I never thought I could do this better than the Founding Fathers. That's a misconception a lot of people seem to have when they hear Oh, this guy's rewriting the Constitution. And I'd like to clarify that this project doesn't have any hate against the Founding Fathers. Just against time. The issue isn't what, the issue is when. That's what's wrong with the Constitution. That it was written then, and it wasn't written 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And that the issues that were addressed back then um, apply in different ways today. Um, so if this, I mean, like, if this isn't a chance for me to be an expert, what is it? I don't actually care if anyone listens to my ideas. I don't care if anyone agrees with my ideas, and I certainly don't care if anyone perpetuates my ideas. What I do care about is that my ideas spark a discussion. If my ideas are disdained, if my ideas are shot down, if my ideas are criticized and spat at, then at the very least they have been acknowledged and someone has spent time thinking about them. And that's all I really want. I don't actually care if anyone agrees with me. Um, and with that in mind, I have a lot of leeway where other people who've attempted this do not have leeway. My conceptions, the things I suggest, aren't designed to be specific suggestions for the Constitution. They're designed to be ideas. Some of them would work as specific ideas. Some of them I would advocate for as specific ideas. But most of them are ideas to spark debate. This is where I think it should begin. That's what a lot of them say. I don't believe that Congress members should be paid the average median salary of a high school female public school teacher. But I said it, and the reason why is to bring up points about congressional pay and its pay comparatively. Um, so, yeah, I rewrote it, but not in the way that most people think I did. Um, it's distressful and concerning that this discussion doesn't seem to be had. That it's had on a legislative level, on a political level, but it's not had on a constitutional level. When people talk about the changes that need to happen in America, they don't seem to be talking about the Constitution. Even issues that have very fundamental basis in the Constitution, the format, the template for how the government runs, this is especially true of Congress, it's true of the executive branch for sure, and to a lesser degree, even the judicial branch. All the suggestions that are being made um, to fix the government, well, a lot of them are legislative, but I would debate that a lot of them have to do with constitutional function. Um, when we go through phases of obstructionism, that's not an issue of legislation, and that's not something that the president can fix or that Congress can fix. And I think that it may be about time that we stop talking about them like we can fix them on that level. Perhaps it's time we begin talking about them on a constitutional level, because that's what the Constitution addresses to begin with. And America has the stigmatization towards change. I think that's why this discussion hasn't been had, or has been had, but on a limited scale that um, we look at this Constitution as somehow it's not something we can touch. It's somehow above us. But it's not. It's not because it's for us. Um, even if you believe that this discussion doesn't have anything to do with the Constitution, and I would be, I would, that's highly annoying to me, but the discussions still need to be had, even if not on a constitutional context. And the Constitution made the most sense to me, personally. Also, it was a way that I could make my senior project, of, you know, just a bit exploited, but yeah. Um, 
Another issue about the Constitution besides, um, besides functionality is, let's see right here. Access. Think of it this way. Some of the smartest English people, um, English enthusiasts, I should say, in America don't know what they're reading when they go over the Constitution. In fact, I don't. I had to pull open a little side window on my Internet Explorer, and I had to look up Constitution Translated. That's literally what I had to look up. I had to break out a page of it in basic English. And the only website that actually did this was a website for people from, like, Spanish-speaking countries, I suppose. ESL kids. Um, and that's, that's how I actually understood what most of it said, because a lot of it didn't make sense in today's English. Um, and that's an issue of accessibility. At the very least, the Constitution needs to be translated into modern English by people in the government who translate what each word means so that we can be working on the same page. It is one thing to have a Constitution that has problems in its functionality. It is quite another to have a Constitution made, for the, made to affect the lives and rights of the government and its citizens when the citizens can hardly understand what it means. So even if we don't change the Constitution, even if we don't edit a single bit of it, it needs to be translated to modern English. And more than modern English, because quite frankly, the people in America today don't just speak modern English. Sorry. They speak Spanish. They speak... They speak Indo-Aryan languages. They speak... They speak Chinese. They speak all sorts of languages. The reality is that I didn't have time to translate it into Spanish, and I don't actually have the ability in Spanish to translate it to Spanish, but I would say that even if I just translated it to modern English, it needs to be translated to far more than that. And the concept behind this isn't just plain accessibility, it's that everyone deserves to know their rights, even if you don't pay attention to it in the English class. Um, it's pretty simple. And also, the organization of the Constitution is fairly, how should I say it, it's not exactly accessible for the modern day person because you have to go through places to find what it is. How telling and how informative are these article titles? Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 4. That doesn't tell you anything. You have to ask a history geek or look in the table of contents to know what's coming up. The Constitution itself should have titles on the articles, but that's subjective and very basic, and it doesn't affect what's actually in the Constitution. What I'm about to suggest would, whether or not you know it's given titles like the Article of Edits, the Article of Agreements, the Judiciary Branch Article, things like this. Um, the most important thing about the Constitution is that it really began with, with the Declaration of Independence. And the ideas in it were, were, to an extent, based... Well, no, I wouldn't say that. But here's what I would say. The purposes of most of the amendments, if you ask me, including the Bill of Rights, which really should be at the front of the Constitution and not hidden somewhere in the back, just an organization thing, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and I think it's the precedent that even after we've acknowledged that these are some of the core root values of American government, they don't seem to take a priority. Um, anybody notice that there's this thing kind of going around about life? It's called the death penalty. Anybody notice that? No? Okay. Um, maybe it's just me. Um, let me just set this up real quick so that I can bring it up. So now that I've explained to you what I mean and um, what I intend and all this, difficulties, sorry. Um, now that I've explained to you all this, I'd like to um, go into what I actually suggested. We don't have a lot of time to do this, but I'm going to try to be quick, go through all that I can. Um, 
But once again, my suggestions themselves are designed to spark a discussion. They're not actually, they're not, not all of them are designed to, okay, this is troubling. They're not all designed to be suggestions within themselves. And I'd like for you to keep that in mind. And I'd also like for you to keep in mind that um, I would prefer you disagree with them. Yeah, I would. Why? I would prefer I would prefer you disagree with me because if you agree with me, then the discussion ends. If you disagree with me, then the discussion continues. Also, here's the thing. A first year law student could tear through these suggestions, and they need to, because if an idea itself, especially in something the con like the Constitution, which people have sentimentality towards and even stubbornness towards changing of, if they don't tear through that, if you don't tear through that, if she doesn't tear through that, then what's going to end up happening is my ideas, and my own ideas, not your ideas, my ideas will go out pretty raw, and they're going to sound stupid. They're going to be rejected. If a discussion is going to have about the Constitution, it needs to begin with really good ideas. I'm not saying my ideas are stupid, but what I am saying is that they can be improved upon, because I'm not an expert, or at least not yet. Actually, I, don't, I said no one is, and I'll stand by that. Okay. So, the first thing I'd like to say about this Constitution is that um, I did miss out on one issue, and I realized it too late, and it was illegal immigration. And um, I don't think this is an issue that's more constitutional than illegal immigration. That isn't addressed in the Constitution. I think that any time you have um, a situation where hundreds of thousands of millions of people, of people are able to be deported for seven straight days without actual charge, I think that's an issue that needs to be discussed. I discussed the Patriot Act in here, which is what gives that authority, but it's more than just that. That wouldn't solve the fundamental issue that American rights are human. Illegal immigration is a constant... Oh, what's up? What's up? Hi. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> but as I, I left out this issue, not because I believe it wasn't worth mentioning, but specifically because I didn't have enough time to address it properly. Everything I wrote here, I really thought out. And if I wrote something down about illegal immigration that wasn't well thought out, and it was a bad idea, and it was perpetuated, then that would hurt the issue. So I didn't think it was a good idea. But know that that is, um, that I deeply believe is a constitutional issue. Um, we should begin at the preamble just to warm up. Personally, I don't think the preamble is a particularly important part of the Constitution, but I think it is a beautiful part of the Constitution. And I changed it because I believe that the preamble at the beginning was somewhat of an introduction. It was a book cover. It like, said, this is why we approved this Constitution. And it's a lot longer, as you can see. And that was... As I said, these are idea generators, so of course it's going to be longer. Um, do I think the preamble should be longer? Not necessarily, but these are for ideas. Does anybody... Okay, you all know the original preamble, yes? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Everyone caught that? Yes. Yes. Cool. This is my preamble. Cool. We, the citizens living in all American states, have approved this Constitution so that it may function from January 1st, 2014 to January 1st, 2012, 2024, you guys might have noticed that, as the template for a government that does all its duties to ensure equality for all its citizens, to keep a fair judicial system, to defend our land, to keep a system of checks and balances, to do its best to give opportunity economically and in terms of personal freedom to its people, to establish order through law and its enforcement, to seek peace domestically and abroad in all affairs wherever possible, to keep its economy healthy, to amend this constitution when its contents in any section are no longer relevant or beneficial, scrolling down for a sec, I'm right here if you're following, to protect the basic human rights every American citizen is entitled to, regardless of country of origin. 
to provide public services, to have a non-tyrannical relationship between the federal government and the governments of its individual states, commonwealths, and territories, and to constantly examine its own effectiveness and morality. Pretty long, right? I don't think a preamble should actually be this long, but these are idea generators. Um, a sp special attention, um, you could ignore the rest of this for all I care. I would rather you not, but the main idea of this is right here. That not only should a constitution um, be updated, but it should be temporary. That the ideas in a constitution that work should be perpetuated, but they should always be challenged. And if they're not challenged, then they should be scheduled to be challenged. I think America has proven pretty thoroughly after, I don't know, 200 some odd years, that we can't exactly rely on ourselves to challenge our own constitution until things get extreme. Say, for example, the 13th Amendment. I don't, I don't even need to talk about that, do I? Do I? No, I okay. I believe 10 years. 10 years is a really short, extreme measure. Um, even Thomas Jefferson, um, one sec. Hey. Hey. Good to see you, man. Here. Even Thomas Jefferson, who um, believed that the con Thomas Jefferson was extreme in his belief to say 15 years. In today's digital age, where things change like this, um, as, Andrew, as Andrew Sullivan said, suddenly, quickly, without rehearsal, um, I don't believe 15 years means the same thing as it did back then. I think 10 years is a better assumption. I think five years, I think the five year, there's a five year difference between what 15 years is now and what 15 years is then, when you consider technology and its ever growing factor. But the 10 years thing um, and technology isn't just in terms of what the government thinks it could do, but what the government can do, especially with um, projects like the Utah Data Center going on, this affects, this is affecting even more. Because 10 years of technology is like 100 of what it used to be. Developments are going faster than ever before as far as I'm concerned. And technological limits are going to need to be put in the Constitution. 2024. In 2024, things will be more advanced than we could have thought of. Especially, as I said, at the rate that people are going. Um, the second most important part was morality. I don't need to say much about that, but if that's not a government duty, I, I'm not quite sure what is. Who's morality? That's a good point. I didn't think of that. Let me just write that down. I mean, if you, one, is a government, can it be moral by definition? Two, you're going to have... A lot of people with pretty different uh, opinions on morality who are pretty convinced that their morality is That's true. the right way. So, um, if, if I may say, um, in terms of morality, the questions of who and the questions of what and the questions of how, as I mean, you're right very, very specifically actually, the questions of how do we define morality, whose morality is morality. Right. And um, the questions that ensue, I would like to say that perhaps, and this may just be a preamble thing, perhaps it'd be better if it was generalized and if these questions went unanswered. By which I mean, because the preamble is an opening to what the government is um, and what it should be, the preamble, like morality itself, should be an ever-going discussion to constantly examine its own effectiveness and morality. Um, I would think that it'd be a good idea to let morality be examined on a time basis. We can't define what morality is or who the morality is for now. I see the slippery slope though, like can the government define other people's morality? Um, and, I, and I see that concern, but I would like to point out that perhaps it'd be best if that was an ambiguous morality. Um. I'm just a little bit confused on um, who is getting to change the Constitution here. Is it the government of America that's revising it every 10 years? Or is it the people that are like um, democratically agreeing what's best for the nation? 
I actually have an article on them, and that's what we're going to go to next if no one else has questions or disagreements or suggestions. Yes, my brony, what's up? Uh, let's, let's see. We the citizens living in all American states. Sorry if this sounds nitpicky, but why not states and territories, or why not states and lands? Why not all American, like, like say Puerto Rico, that's not a state, that's a territory. Okay. That's um, that's true. We don't have close control over that. I would I would definitely include them, and I personally believe they should even we should even go as far to give them electoral votes, especially because we protect them and they are affected by everything we decide. But Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, um, I'm not sure about the Northerns, but they have all stated their own independence and claimed their own independence. Oh, okay. Um, even though they're basically we're basically babysitting them, so I would include them, but we can't. Um, two, two little things. Uh, you say protect basic human rights. There are no basic human rights. Uh, you're born into the world and you don't gain rights until you become a citizen of some country. So there are no human rights. Um, the other thing is, I, I, I side with you on the preamble thing, mentioning morality and leaving that ambiguous, because it is a preamble, but it comes up in the second clause of your fourth section of your uh, executive articles, uh, where you mentioned that the, the president will be impeached if he attempts to desecularize the government. And I, I know that desecularization here is, uh, I, you know, I, that would be uh, grossly against a lot of what you're talking about, but I'm mostly thinking about the ways, because it says that would be defined as any attempt to instill the values of a specific religion. But if we have, say, for example, uh, you're not allowed to murder people or steal, then those could be ascribed to specific religions that, you know, advocate in the in the kind of negative on those things. So, I mean, the problem is, you could have people from you know warring parties in our government, which they're usually apt to do, uh, bringing the president up on impeachment charges pretty much constantly. I think that's where that morality thing would start to have a, a that slippery slope you're talking about because morality is something that you know it's uh, it's about as easy to define as love. So I, I think that that would create some some trickiness for your um, for that notion of morality sneaking in. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, that was, that was stupid of me to put in. Um, but here's what I would say. Um, as I said in the beginning, these are designed to bring up ideas. Right, right. No, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, oh, like, right. I'm not trying to nitpick here. I'm really just trying to say that Nitpicking um, is some, some, of these, some of these points that you have here, they're going to start to overlap on one another. And, um, and I know that they're not meant to be uh, uh, definitive, but I think it's mostly to just point out where that morality clause could start to, you know, become a thorn in the side of the document. Thanks. Um, what I would like to say um, is that, um, thanks for pointing that out, and um, the, what, the idea I was trying to circulate um, over this, the desecularization of being an impeachment-worthy crime, um, what I'm really, what I'm really trying to get around is, um, what I'm really trying to say is that, um, secularization should be, um, secularization needs to be taken more seriously. Um, I agree that, um, I agree that, yeah, this is actually pretty silly, but at the same time, what I am, what I am trying to say is that, um, secularization should be a priority in a very theocratic way. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with the, the, the kind of gist of this clause in that it's making uh, this check, the separation of church and state accountable even at the executive level. And I think that that's, that's the value of this clause. I'm only, I'm only kind of linking it back to that, that kind right. of preamble. Um, to be honest, I think that the citizens of the United States have been the most effective when dealing with that. Um, when dealing with secularization? Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but can we talk about that um, near the end? 
Um, I'd love to hear from you on that, by the way. That's not trying to... I, I want to hear about it. One Catholic president. He was assassinated. That was just my opinion. Um, Sorry. You were going to say something, right? Yeah, do you think there's been a huge problem with uh, presidents? Would any of the presidents have been able to be uh, impeached because of not because of being contrary to your secular clause? I personally do not believe, I don't believe that the American presidency has experienced a lot of, um, it's been, I mean, it, the position has been filled by religious people, but I don't believe that um, desecularization has really been a problem in the context of the presidential office. What I'm really worried about is it becoming an issue in the presidential office as, um, I realize that extreme theocracy is on the way out. I realize that um, less and less people are going for it, and that even the Republican Party, the major one of the major parties in the binary, is starting to lose traction because it's attached itself to its religious fanaticism, which is fantastic. But the, the and make no mistake about it, this is aimed at this movement. The right wing Christian evangelist political movement has a lot of power, e even in the political realm, especially in the congressional realm. And what I'm worried about is um, it entering the presidential realm. And that's why I take it so seriously, okay, because what, as a Jew living What is the current, the current Second Amendment, I mean, First Amendment says there can be no, it has an establishment clause, and then a free exercise clause. Do you want to take those further than what's currently there? In other words, it says you cannot establish a state religion, nor can you prohibit people from freely exercising their own religion. Um, what so you're saying kind of like if the president attempts to interject religion into the government that... Well, not necessarily... And why, why does the president even have that kind of power because he's executing the laws rather than creating them? Well, but the president... How should I say this? Um, the first thing I heard in that question was about um, the presidency and... what. Well, the First Amendment, right? Yeah, the First Amendment, dealing with religion, has two clauses, though. Um, Do you object in? That, Do you think they're not strong enough, or that there needs to I be think, more? I think that they're strong enough, and I think that they're very definitive, but I don't think that they... I think they, they were written strong enough, but I don't think um, America has taken them seriously enough. What I mean to say is that the First Amendment clearly defines freedom of religion, and that the government shall make no law favoring the establishment of a religion. That's a direct quote. No. If I'm not no. mistaken, is it? Like, but anyway, what what I am saying is that as theocratic politicians have entered Congress, I think I think that that law has clearly been not sorry has been su has been to an extent not disregarded, but it's been ignored by several members of our Congress, right. um, and even governors. You hear governors talking about how it the separation needs to be eliminated. Not that they have power to change that separation, but they do have power to violate it and then claim it. No, I would agree. I would, I would agree there's more of an issue on the state and local level than there right. is on the it's, level. Right. Um, let me see here. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Congress. God. I'm sorry. Turn it off. Yeah, I'm just going to do that. Um, Congress is, um, Congress, I believe, and the rules surrounding the first article, I think, might be the biggest constitutional issue of today. No, scratch that. It is. It is. Um, when Congress members don't have to show up for a solid <coughs> two full days of the week, when they can show up on Tuesday, go until Thursday, not show up Friday, go to their home state until next Tuesday, and show up late in the afternoon to the session, we have an issue, not just of efficiency, but of cooperation. How is the president supposed to work with a Congress that is consistently campaigning, and vice versa? Um, and that's one of the issues that I attempt to, um, I attempt to prescribe solutions to, campaigning. Um, 
Congress and the presidency are very political jobs, and one of the things you're going to find in my um, first article is that um, is that I'm hoping to really prevent in Congress campaigning because legitimately Congress shouldn't be a political job, or at least in my opinion. Because as Congress remains a political job, one of the main parts of the job remains trying to keep your job. So one of the things I did was I banned consecutive elections. I made the presidential term six years. You get elected to a two-year term. You get paid basically crap for that term. And you're not allowed to be elected until the next term. And if you were elected at the end of that term, then you have to have a gap term. Um, as, we, as we go through this, um, you'll probably have objections, disagreements, ideas. Write them down and tell me, and yeah. So the first thing I wrote down is, the, um, is that no member of the House of Representatives or the Senate can be elected twice, so I explained that. Um, one thing I noticed between the House of Representatives and the Senate is that they have different requirements. For some reason, the vote of the House of Representatives member requires 25 years of age, but to be a senator, you need to be 30, and to be a president, you need to be 35. And this creates a differentiation of lens. Um, when members of the House of Representatives haven't lived through those five years, those, year, those five years as American citizens that the Senate has, that creates a voting discrepancy, or at least in my eyes where they have experiences that the other house has not. And because both sides, both parts of Congress are needed to pass anything, um, this interferes with cooperation. I don't actually have evidence that it has caused cooperation, but I think it certainly would help if that would be installed. But once again, that's an idea. And the idea, the concept behind it is making more cooperation opportunities between the two, house, between the two parts of Congress. Um, one rule is, excuse me, how did, how did it get that far? I'm sorry about this. You have to be 30 years old, be a citizen for at least seven years, and live in the state you're chosen to represent. These are the same requirements I listed for the presidency. Um, and the reason why I listed the same requirements for the presidency, the House, and the Senate is because age discrepancy shouldn't be a problem. But to be in the House, the minimum age is a 10-year difference from that of being the president. And the years of citizenship are different from that of being the president. If Congress is the route the president has to get through, Congress should at least be able to understand from a time perspective the, the view of their difference. Or the view of what they see in American history reflecting in that day. At least in my opinion. Um, and there will be no attack ads in the campaigns. You can read this right here. Um, what I constitutes can... as an attack ad? Sorry? What constitutes as an attack ad? An attack? That's a good point. I should really define that. Um, what constitutes as an attack ad is an, advertise is a, is an advertisement. Um, that's a good point. Would that, I should really think about whether that would constitute debates and etc. But the concept and idea behind this is that there's nothing quite as divisive as a direct attack on another candidate when you're, especially when you're attacking like today, how they do on party lines, and you have to cooperate from people who belong to the same party and line, align themselves with that person that you just attacked on party lines. Um, but yeah, you're right, I should really define that. Thanks. Um, another thing I have, and a lot of people are going to find this very radical. Um, me, personally, I am very tired of a two-party binary. I think it creates a lot of inefficiencies within Congress when you have a two-party binary that specifically, where one has to work on the other and there's not a filter party. Does anybody feel what I'm talking about? Um, the Democrats and the Republicans have proven they can't exactly get along very well, so I've created provisions so they have to get along, like manda mandatory seating and all this. But I think the most important thing we have to instill is a party in there somewhere else. I don't think it's constitutional to let this go on. Which is why my prescribed solution is states will be represented in the House based on population, dot, dot, dot. 
Um, any state with two representatives must have two different parties represented amongst those representatives. Any state with three or more representatives must have three or more parties represented. How are you going to do that? Pretty simple. Because how? Because in the House of wait, any state with three or more representatives. Oh, I was thinking of that's a typo, guys. I was thinking of the Senate. Wow, I really messed up there. Um, but yeah, that only really that can only really apply to the Senate because no, that House is. It would apply to the House, but say Kentucky has. What do we have? But the House of Representatives are elected by district. Senate only has two. Well, I need th I need three senators. No, you need three senators. But how can you guarantee that three different parties are going to get elected? Well, what I do is I well what I did in the provisions for the election is I had um, I had senators senators are elected by state. Um, they don't represent three different section two different sections right. of states. So what I did was um, I made the here. Let me sorry about that. You gave every citizen three votes. That's right. So they vote within all within three separate parties. Here we go. In the Senate, each state gets three senators, all of which will be elected by a public election in which each citizen voting gets three votes, all for candidates from a different party. One of them may be from no party. They will serve terms of six years. Wait, what? They will serve terms of two years. Senate? Senate is no different than the House. Yeah. Each senator gets one vote per legislation. They must be from. They must be from three different parties. Wouldn't they? What? Uh, you said you didn't want them uh, campaigning constantly, but if they were, like, I mean, Senate races now are every six years, right? So, if they're doing it every two years, when are they going to be not campaigning? They can't run um, too much. They they can never have consecutive. Yeah. Right. Okay. I believe. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. The problem with that is there I, is... Oh, I wrote right here. To be a congressman or a congresswoman, one must be at least 30 years old, have been a citizen for at least seven years, and lived in the state they are chosen to represent. They cannot be elected to represent a state twice during the same presidential term or twice in a row. Okay, gotcha. My bad. Um, okay. Uh, the problem I have with that is that uh, a lot... A good bit of amount of that time will actually be people getting used to their job. In two years, it's not that long. Two years is not that long, but in terms of Congress, I think Congress has proven that they can um, work with that time very efficiently. I think two years has been proven to be enough time. Um, but that's a discussion for. That's that's going to be part of a larger discussion. I have twenty minutes. I really got to get through this, but I agree with you that it has to be a part of the debate. Sorry. Um, no, don't don't be sorry. I asked for all this. I really I really appreciate it. Um, another thing I said was um, that their um, Congress salary. Yes. I wanted to get to this. Sorry about this. Um, Here's, here we go. Every year, the average yearly salary... Remember, this is for ideas. This isn't an actual suggestion. Every year, the average yearly salary of the, the female public high school teacher will be calculated. That is what Congress members will be paid every year as well. Congress will not be paid or compensated during the time period after the fiscal year has begun if they are late approving the spending bills. The salaries will come from the U.S. Treasury. If Congress approves a bill but then doesn't approve the taxes that would cover the entirety of it, then they have also given direct permission to the president to borrow the rest of the needed funds. In other words, what I'm saying is, if Congress is late on the budget, which they have been most of the time for the last, you know, since 1952, from which they've only been on time five times, then we shouldn't be paying them. That's like a basic responsibility of Congress, and somehow they're not doing it. I think that's not only a staple of our pay, but I think that's a staple of our function. When Congress can't meet deadlines, that is a fundamental issue that affects us all. And we're paying them. Um, and another, and here's the really important part: yearly salary. Congress gets paid a crap ton. I I don't know how we came to the consensus that they can vote on their own pay. Why did you put female? You think public schools pay different for female and male teachers? 
I would say, I would say, um, I said female to bring up ideas about the gender gap. Um, I didn't mention it anywhere else in here. I think that that is indeed a constitutional issue, and um, no, I don't think female public school teachers are paid less. But what I would say is I put in female to bring up the issue of the pay gap. Because nowhere else in this did I bring it up. Yes? Uh, back to the beginning. Uh, I should have said this earlier, but the states thing. Um, the state. uh, yeah, it's like, oh, it should be states and territories or something. Uh, from what I've heard, um, um, Puerto I'm Rico does not give a crap, but Washington, D.C. does. Um, Puerto Rico. That's an interesting idea. I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, another major issue in Congress is that one small minority can keep the rest from voting. Under what I've written, a majority, a simple majority, or even 50% of Congress voting can stop a refusal to vote. When a leader or a chair refuses to allow a vote to happen or doesn't get to that vote, then it takes 50% of Congress, or the House of Congress that we're talking about, the Senate or the House of Representatives, to override that refusal. That's not fair to anybody. Um, also, if anyone has ever seen a diagram of how Congress members are seated in either part, it's kind of like girls and boys in middle school. There's guys on one side, there's girls on the other side, and the reality is that they shouldn't be sitting like that. They should be sitting next to each other, which is why I put, and this is, this is a constitutional issue, because this is an issue of cooperation. This is an issue of Congress members being able to consent with one another. If Congress members are seated separately physically, then they're separated mentally, which is why I made it mandatory that they sit next to at least one member of another party. I would answer your question, but I we got 15 minutes left. Um, I spent a lot of time taking these back. Um, moving on to the executive branch. Um, six year terms. Six year terms, no limits on how many times you can be elected, but a gap year between each election. And the reason why I prescribe this, there's a lot of reasons. One of which is the four year term is simply not enough to work with Congress. A four-year term has proven that we can't, um, a four-year term has proven inefficient to evaluate how well a president has done on an official scale. Take for example, um, take for example most, take for example Obamacare. Everyone see what I'm saying? Um, and they changed the elect, the electing system. The electing system, this is the most important part. The Electoral College guarantees that not a lot of people can actually count in their votes. If you are a Texas Democrat, then your vote does not count. If you are a Kentucky Democrat, your vote does not count. If you are a Vermont Republican, your vote does not count. If you are a Republican in Idaho, your vote does not count. Anyone see what I'm saying? Because it is a take-all system. It is a first-past-the-post system. If you win more than 50% of the vote, then all those votes go to you. Meaning everyone who voted against you, your who voted against that candidate, those votes are now irrelevant. And not only that, but it's almost it's almost completely irrelevant if you vote for someone from a third party, which is why I prescribe the A B system. The A B system works like this. If you don't mind, it's cool. So currently, here's what we have. Democrat, Republican, sometimes it'll have a Green Party and a write-in. So currently you check one, which means that you have to strategically vote. Voting for a third party candidate is almost foolish in a state where it has a chance of swinging one way or the other. Because voting for another party would take away votes from the, the party you can stand the second most. That's called the spoiler effect. And it's a detriment to American society the way I see it. Um, as the third senate, senator rule comes into play with the third party, third party people running for positions will become more of a relevant idea. If they're in the senate, then eventually the idea that they can run in other positions, in my mind at least, will perpetuate and they'll be able to run in more and more positions as time goes on. 
thus beating the two-party binary. And under this system, people will have to be unafraid to vote. So under alternative vote, here's what happens. And this is, this happens nowhere else in the world. So America would be an experiment here. You list your preferences, one, two, three. What happens when your first candidate loses? Okay, so the first candidate lost. Now, all those votes are eliminated, but where do they go? They don't just get thrown out. Your vote for the first one, who has lost because they have the least amount of votes, goes to the person who had the most second choices in this first group. So those votes go to this party, because, the mo because more people than anyone else in this party listed this party as their second choice. And in this way, when you vote for a party, even if that party probably won't win, your vote is set, is circulated. Your vote goes to here. On top of this, it means that votes where you're the minority don't go away. Someone in Texas who's a Democrat will have their vote counted because there will be no electoral college. It's not take-all system. Because votes now belong to the people and not to the states. But, So this would be for a presidential election? Yes. Um, okay, what else did I put? Um, executive branch. Right. Um, why? Why does Congress get to pick the Supreme Court? And why does the president have, why does the president put forward a suggestion and Congress have to approve it? I don't get this. Neither parts of the government have ever had experience in being a Supreme Court judge. This is, in, this is highly political, where a politician can pick somebody who they think will lean towards what they believe, which defeats a lot of the purpose of the Supreme Court. And it's been going on since the beginning of the Supreme Court, where people have battled in for that pick of the Supreme Court. Quite a few presidents, no, it was just one really slid that in at the end of the last final move, like, yes, this is my mark forever. It was one of the Adams. Um, here's my opinion. The Supreme Court, and this is what I wrote, the Supreme Court judges nominate three candidates, and the president picks one. This way, the Supreme Court judges use what they know about being a Supreme Court judge and use their own criteria to pick people who, under their criteria, meet the requirements to be a Supreme Court judge. And the president, being fair, because we can't make this a one-branch business, gets to sign his seal of approval or disapproval. Doesn't that then guarantee that the Supreme Court will stay exactly as it is into futurity? I mean, if you have a group of Scalia's choosing who they want next, they'll take the next job of the hut looking Republican weirdo that they can find. And That'll continue to perpetuate. They'll just find three of those weirdos. Right? Not, not they'll take. They'll take Todd Akin. You know. Not if the president disapproves. Well, he he. It, so that it'll continue until he he picks someone for the position. But this could go on. This could go. They on. could they could Which? continue to stall this, and and be voting. You know, say you know if a if a more lenient judge were to go out, they could continue to stall this process. Into futurity. This could actually happen, which is, which is why I subscribed um, as well an issue to that, which would be that a Supreme Court judge can, res uh, well, it's, it's already official, but I wrote that they can resign. But another thing is that a Supreme Court judge under this Constitution can be inspected by a general, uh, an inspector general, not a military general. The Supreme Court is not somehow a, is not somehow invincible to scrutiny, and I think it should never be. And that's why that's why I believe they should be subject to examination. If Todd Akin is making bizarre, you know, rulings based on bizarre reasoning with bizarre backup, then he can be eliminated from that office. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. That's that's ridiculous. I didn't even write down the procedure for that. That's something I have to write down. That's a flaw in my constitution. I think, I think your inspector generals came in uh, about the death penalty. Yeah, that that was definitely a mess up in my constitution. Uh, thanks for finding that out.
Um, let's see here. What else do we have? 